In strain imaging, there are some important rules to have to follow to take appropriate measurements. For example, the first thing I always take a look at are my frames per second. You should be in the range of 50 to 80 according to the literature. Most optimal is in between 60 to 70. Here you can see the frames per second. 69 is optimal. Another important tip or what you have to take a look at is the heart rate. The heart rate should be always in the same range. So a few beats per minute difference won't do any harm to your measurements. But for example, if you have atrial fibrillation and you want to do a, a left ventricular strain and you have a heart rate of 60 to 70 in one loop, so the four chamber view, for example, and you have, uh, for example, in the next loop, a two chamber view, 70, 80, 90 or 100, then the measurement won't be possible. So you always have to check if the heart rate is approximately the same. Something else that is very important is that we have to pay attention that we do not use too many knobs while scanning or acquiring optimal images for strain imaging. This now is a personal long axis view, so we won't use this for strain imaging, but you can see that the depth was changed right at the beginning I change the depth. If you do that, you cannot use this view for strain imaging. Because if we try it now, so just go into the setting, even though it's the wrong loop, it will tell you that this loop has a change in geometry. So the frequency, the depth or the width have been changed. So this is very important to notice because overall, when you do that in the views you need for strain imaging and you change, for example, the width, of the sector or the depth as it is shown in this example, you cannot do strain imaging. Then let's have a look which views we can use. Here is another one, an example where there is color Doppler added and even color Doppler is changing. So also these views are not possible to use for strain imaging. So if you add color Doppler, keep in mind, you cannot use it for strain imaging. You don't even see the option here. If you want to use strain imaging, you should have an optimal ventricular focused four chamber view. In optimizing the image, you can always use more gain that you can yourself delineate the myocardium or the endocardium even better. Take a look how thick the myocardium is. You want to always adjust the region of interest as I will show you in later videos to the myocardium. So that's the first view or one of the views we will need. Then the next views we will need are not only this nice four chamber view, but also a two chamber view and an apical long axis view. Always keep in mind that the views have to be as optimal as possible. And when you don't see the endocardial borders, also the machine will have a problem to see the endocardial borders. Also be always aware to make the width broad enough that you really see the entire myocardium. So here it's a little bit cut off. So this is also not an optimal view for strain imaging. In case of the right ventricle, you need an optimized right ventricular view. We will talk about right ventricular strain in separate lectures and videos, but be aware that you also have to use an optimized for chamber view to delineate the free wall of the right ventricle. In case of strain imaging, there are several things you have to pay attention to when you perform such an exam. First of all, you want to make sure that the B-mode image is optimal. When the B-mode image is optimal, like in this case, you see a nice four chamber view. Um, you could even cut off the atria here to perform a strain imaging of the left ventricle. Um, you make sure that you can delineate all the endocardial borders over here. If you have that, you can go here to measure and just simply put on the measurement. And there you see there will be some dots. These dots represent the walls or the tracking of the walls of the left ventricle. What I like to do is I put up the gain so that I can delineate the um, endocardial borders better. And if I stop moving with my mouse, that's maybe also an important tip. The machine or the program will simply auto calculate at some point, but we don't want to do that. So we want to optimize our image. So we simply go back. And what else uh, we can optimize is that if the machine didn't track the endocardial borders perfectly fine, we can adjust. We just 
press with our mouse in the inner side and then we can move the dots around as we think the endocardial borders are located. A very nice effect here is the so-called yo-yo effect. The yo-yo effect shows how the heart is moving. This is actually pretty nice because a moving image is easier for our eyes to see. Don't make it too broad because then it will be hard to really follow the endocardial borders. But with a little bit of movement or motion, it's simply easier to delineate. Now, you want to adjust the borders a little bit more so that really are tracking the myocardium. One very nice feature is that you can move the outer parts outside or inside if the myocardium is thickened or hypertrophied. Overall, look at the region of interest. This area is called region of interest and you can also adapt the ROI width. So if you make it smaller, you have less of the myocardium you are tracking. Overall, you want to place it just above the myocardium. So don't make it too broad. Then the machine or the software will also calculate the blood flow or the, the, the cavity of the left ventricle or the outer parts of the ventricle, also the pericardium, but really adapt the ROI, so the region of interest to the myocardium and endocardial borders. So this might be a good image. And now let's see how it looks like. We see that all the tracking is done really nicely. Here we can see the tracking. The machine is not sure if it tracked properly, but as we see with the motion of the myocardium, this is tracked quite fine. Overall, the global longitudinal strain of the four chamber view is minus 23.7%, which would be normal. This is a young, healthy individual, so we would expect normal. We see that all maximum strain values are in the very red or dark red areas, which is also normal in the strain M mode. And we do see nice curves which delineate diastole and systole. So this is the maximum contraction of the segments of the left ventricle. You see here this dotted line. This is the overall tracing. So all the curves put together. And if you now delete one curve, you see that here it's gray. So here we do not take this curve into account if we see that it's not optimally working. And we can do that with each and every segment so that you can also see the individual curves. Overall, when there are two segments not being tracked, that would be borderline. Optimal is all segments traced nicely. And if there is one not tracing nicely, that you can also use for diagnostics. Then we can continue with the next views, the two chamber view and the three chamber view. You simply to continue and go on. And if you do that, you can go to the next view, for example, this view here, and it will show you if the tracing is appropriately done and you can continue the entire example. Let's see in another example how it is done again. You see again a four chamber view. Now the four chamber view is focused on the left ventricle. You can delineate the endocardial borders quite nicely, but still we can adjust it a little bit. We again do the automatic imaging and it places us this region of interest on our field of view. Now we can adjust the Roy width already so that it is uh, optimal and we can adjust what we see and also we can simply turn up the gain a little bit to even delineate the endocardial borders better. So this is better for Mariah and better to see. So there are certain pitfalls. Not only the ROI per se is important, but also how you can see, for example, hypertrophy. So if there is an hypertrophied region, you can use this part on the outside to even trace the myocardium better, but always be aware that you want to keep it in a range where it is okay. So you can make this ROI tremendously huge. So now let's do that and just exemplify how that would look like, how the tracing would look like. And of course, the tracing on the outer parts is different compared to the inner parts. So we are not in the myocardium anymore, but we are also tracing the surrounding tissues which explains a lower value. In this case, we do not want to do that, even though the curves are quite nicely. We do know from the B-mode image that this cannot be a good view. So we just 
stop it. We do not want to use these measurements. So we try this again and we take the automatic software and we try to delineate the borders nicely. Now we do it the other way around. We make the region of interest very, very small. So now the myocardium is not entirely traced. And you see that now the machine has problems to follow the myocardium. This is quite a nice uh, teaching point because in this case you can see that the myocardium, how it moves is not traced and how the speckles are moving around. This cannot be optimal. So this has to be a wrong measurement. So even if we take everything into account, we get a measurement which is just random. So we have here even this kinesia, so the very red parts show normal kinesia, the blue parts in maximum systole show this kinesia even here. So this would be normal motion of myocardium or at least as it would be traced. And here we would have a part of this kinesia. So this cannot be normal. So that we cannot uh, take into account. This of course we cannot use. We can try to optimize it or just see what happens when we put the delineation more into the myocardium. Here we try to just give it a little bit of a broader view and we try to process it again. So of course you shouldn't do it like that, but if it's in the myocardium, you see the motion again is normal. So now the tracing is better, but still it's just random what we measure here. So that we of course cannot use. So we stop this measurement as well. And now we try to perform an accurate measurement again and simply by just adjusting it a little bit. So we are tracing the endocardial borders. You see that the machine is doing it quite nicely. I do not have to adjust that much. And now let's see what the conclusion is here. So we have now a normal longitudinal strain in this apical four chamber view. Do not include the papillary muscles. That's very important. And be aware the further you pull the speckles downwards, the measurement of the basal segments will be reduced. Why is that? Always the basal segments are a little bit less contracting compared to the apical segments. But if you just put it more down, you're tracking the mitral valve annulus, which is just firmer tissue compared to the myocardium. So you have to be aware to not measure the mitral valve annulus or the left atrium even in this view. So we also take this measurement so we can continue with our next measurement and apical pre-chamber view to succeed in all the measurements. In case if the machine cannot trace it as properly as you would want to, you just have to adjust a little bit more. Uh, here you can make the ROI a little bit broader and let's see what the machine comes up with. You're always free to not use a specific image. So because here in the anteroseptal regions, you see that the tracing doesn't work that nicely. It's only minus 16 here. It's minus 15. Here the tracing maybe doesn't work properly here. It's also not sure what it's tracing. So this view, for example, I wouldn't take even though the measurement overall seems plausible. Also take a look at the curves here. You see that the uh, segment over here, so the mid-segment anteroseptal um, is contracting a little bit dyskinetic compared to the, to the rest. So this might also not be an optimum measurement. So just looking at the B-mode image and the measurements you get out of this, you might not want to use this view.